This video is brought to you by Unique. With a new generation of touch-first users on the rise, there are plenty of reasons to consider the iPad as part of your desk setup, as it can seriously boost your productivity game. So in this guide, I will dive into the quirks, perks and missed chances when it comes to hooking up an iPad to a monitor or going all in on a fully fledged setup. From handy tips and tricks to iPad OS 18 upgrades plus a few additional oddball observations, this video will give you a clear idea of what to expect and maybe a few surprises along the way. Everything of course starts from the process of connecting the iPad to a setup which cannot be done at random. There are two factors to consider here. First and foremost, the iPad cannot work in clamshell mode. So if you have an iPad cradle in a keyboard case, you won't be able to shut it closed simply to wake it up on the big screen. And I'll explain as to why that is along the way. When it comes to a desk setup, the iPad needs to be the star, active and placed front and center. Mentioning center, you have four monitor placement positions in the settings of the iPad. Top, bottom, left and right. Right, left, Never mind. Of course, you have the mirroring option as well, but who would actually use that? When it comes to monitors that work with the iPad, there are plenty of choices. In fact, almost any monitor will work with the iPad, but what you should pay attention to are built-in ports, specifically USB-C, because if you don't have powered USB-C, you won't be able to power the iPad or provide power to it, and you won't be able to have a single connection installment, which means you'll have to rely on a dock, which is not bad, but it makes things a little bit more complicated. So make sure you have something with, let's say, power delivery 60 watts by USB-C and maybe some additional USB-A ports that might come in handy if you want to plug in peripherals or something else. If you want to have the iPad situated either on the left or the right, you can totally do that, but you might want to consider a laptop riser or some sort of a stand because unlike the Mac, you cannot fine tune the precise location of the main screen relative to the monitor. So you have to think placing the iPad strategically. However, the position that makes most sense to me, or in my opinion, is bottom. Moving up and down between both displays works just fine, but more importantly, having a bottom placement will have the iPad placed closer to your face which will allow you to take advantage of Face ID when logging in and authenticating. If the iPad is placed further to the side, every time you want to use Face ID, you'd have to, you know, either turn your head or in most cases, turn your head and lean over. <laughs> if you participate in meetings and you don't have a third party webcam at your disposal, you kind of look if someone is interviewing you, which isn't ideal. Oh, you mean the camera is there? <laughs> Yeah, camera is there. Camera is there, I'm sorry. Another benefit of a bottom iPad placement is doubling it with, let's say, the Magic Keyboard as the main keyboard in the setup, something that works great in a more minimal desk setup approach. Now, technically, you can achieve a top position of the iPad with the help of something like this rolling square magnet gizmo, which I featured in my favorite iPhone accessories. What this allows you to do is mount pretty much anything anywhere with the help of the versatility of the hinge and the strong magnets. So on the back of the monitor, I've stuck a plate and all I have to do is just snap this into place like this. Keeping in mind that I have a puck stuck on the back of the iPad and just mount it as easy as this. So now finally, I can go to arrangement and say that the iPad is on the top of the monitor, which means that if I grab the settings window, I can just drag it down to the external display. Now, this to me makes no sense, but it's possible. Now, I might be getting a little ahead of myself here, but I wanna point this out early on. When you are interacting with the big screen, there are three ways to, three ways to open an app. First, you can open it from the app library, but that's only on the iPad, not the monitor. And I'll get to why in a moment. The second and my personal favorite is using Spotlight. Command plus space while being actively doing something on a monitor and few symbols later and boom, you're opening an app very quick. And of course, the third way is through the dock. The dock 
is a big deal in any setup. So it's worth taking the time to organize it based on how you plan to use it in your setup. And by the way, if you end up enjoying this video, subscribe because why not? So a rather important iPad OS support improvement few people are talking about is the ability to use the iPad vertically in a setup. Thankfully, upon rotation, the iPad retains its correct placement, allowing you to seamlessly move around in a bottom stacked setup like this. Of course, that would only be possible if you use some sort of a rotating stand. Talking about a rotating stand, this is the Rise 360 iPad protective case by Unique. The reason this Unique case is unique is the integrated 360 degree rotating disc, which works flawlessly in the example I just showcased. But let me back up for a second. Cradling the iPad in this case introduces quite a few benefits, the first of which is the finish, which feels very soft and premium to the touch. One complaint that I've always talked about is the accidental detachment at the Apple Pencil when placing the iPad in bags, which Unique has addressed with a holder backed up by a built-in magnetic flap for even more secure closure. Furthermore, the front cover with anti-slip inner lining also serves as a foldable stand providing four different viewing angles an ideal one for sketching, watching movies and more. The most elevated ergonomic position is where things get quirky as the iPad can be rotated 360 degrees, allowing easy switching between vertical and horizontal positions in just a second. So check out the unique Rise 360 protective case in the first link in the description below. Now, when we talk about the iPad in a desk setup, Stage Manager is the key player. If you really don't use it on a regular, when you interact with the iPad, he will be there whether you like it or not, once you establish a connection, as this is the foundation for the secondary display. Interestingly enough, you can turn off Stage Manager at any point while working in a setup, but that will take effect only on the iPad. Talking about things that only take effect on the iPad, if you tap on the battery percentage thing on the monitor, it shows up on the iPad. And this is not iPad OS 18 problem. It's a thing that has been going on for, I think it was since iPad OS 16, I'm not sure. I wouldn't call this a missed opportunity, but it's a plain oversight in my opinion. Back to Stage Manager. Regardless if you have it turned on or off, it is active on the monitor screen. Every time you tap to open an app from the dock, it will be a windowed version. And what's questionable here is the fact that each app opens in a separate Stage Manager space. In order to open an app alongside other apps in the same space, you have to learn and remember to use the Shift key upon tapping the app. That works both when you tap and open an app from the dock or you tap on already open app from the side. Sadly, even with iPad OS 18, the monitor remains an empty canvas whose job is to simply house Windows and the dock, of course. Coming from any other device, you might think you'll be able to place app icons, widgets, or files, but that won't be the case. This makes the iPad your primary device, a device where you can arrange your home screen to your liking and summon app library, something that's not possible on the external monitor either. This is the reason the iPad cannot operate in clamshell mode, even if it has the power to do so. Thankfully, there are some iPad OS 18 upgrades worth mentioning here, the biggest of which being the behavior of a window between both displays. I can finally drag and move a window from the iPad to the monitor or vice versa, eliminating the need to use the three little dots on the top. Now, talking about the three little dots, one thing you won't see anywhere are the traffic light buttons you might be used from the Mac. Unfortunately, if you want to hide an app and you end up using the Mac muscle memory, Command plus H, or Command plus H, H, you will hide the active app in question alongside all other apps from that open space. They simply shrink down and disappear to the dock only to be found in the app switcher. If you tap on any of the apps that were in the space when it was hidden, you will bring back you know, this camaraderie. Using the three little dots, by the way, will be the only easy way to make an app go full screen with an asterisk. Not all apps can go full screen. CapCut, which is a very popular mobile video editor, for example, cannot extend to take advantage of the monitor. Based on the developer of the app, the best thing that you can do is grab it by the corner and expand it according to its allowed aspect ratio as much as you can. Once you make an app go full screen, naturally you might think that if you click on the three little dots you can exit full screen, but no, you can actually make it full screen again, 
which doesn't make sense. The only way that you can exit full screen is to grab it by the corner and just shrink it down. I really hope Apple pays attention here. Another observation to note is when it comes to adjusting brightness. The keyboard shortcuts, whether you use an iPad keyboard or an external one, will only take effect on the iPad. If you use the iPad in tandem with, let's say, the Apple Studio display, the only way to adjust the brightness of the Studio display is by going to the Settings app, Display and Brightness, and inside the Studio display, you'll find the slider to do that. Fortunately, you have Auto Brightness available, so I guess that works. That, of course, doesn't apply if we talk about third-party monitors. In that case, you'll have to rely on the on-screen controls of the monitor in question to fine-tune you know, that brightness. Gladly, the iPad has come a long way when it comes to peripherals. If I were to plug the iPad to my Thunderbolt dock, for example, pretty much everything I have will come to life, including the hardwired stuff. The keyboard lights up, the mouse that is plugged in via dongle immediately shows up, and even the webcam powers up. The speakers are also at my disposal, having a very natural way of controlling the volume. With iPad OS 18, there are now new controls to adjust the webcam settings as well. Once the webcam is active for, let's say, FaceTime, under the control center, there's something called system controls. <laughs> I guess that's the natural way to call it, which will allow you to adjust the mic settings and camera effects such as studio light, center stage reactions and more. An important caveat to remember in this scenario is the lack of software controls for third-party accessories. For example, I am unable to install software for the Insta360 Link camera, nor I'm able to, you know, tell the iPad to switch to its built-in hardware. What I mean by that is that when my speakers are hooked up, I cannot tell the iPad to switch to its built-in speakers. Same goes for the webcam. The only choice I have is to unplug one of them if I want to use the default speakers or peripherals or you know what I mean. The silver lining here is that I can use the built-in functionalities of the Insta360 Link and rely on features like auto tracking which happens by just waving my hand like this to enable it and now the camera will keep me in focus which means that I can still flex in meetings with the iPad. What's cool here is that if I plug in an external drive onto my dock or hub, I will be able to interact with it on the fly and for the first time even format that drive. Formatting is one of the new iPad OS 18 features that I talked about in getting the most out of the iPad guide, which I'll link at the end of this video. In terms of gaming, this tablet has been a total champ adapting all sorts of third-party controllers and support, including the ability to use the Nintendo Switch Joy-Cons. Pair that with the large canvas of an external monitor and of course, immersive speakers if they're present and things look pretty good except for the inability to enter full screen you know what this makes me realize that this is the only time you might want to consider ipad screen mirroring so you can actually take advantage of the big screen as much as possible wow i just realized that unfortunately i don't see this shortcoming changing anytime soon as that will involve improving on the fundamentals that have been the showstopper so far. Few things that further haven't changed yet are stuff like screen recording. If you trigger a screen recording, you will essentially be recording the iPad screen, which is not necessarily a bad thing, leaving the big screen to place or store meeting notes or other materials that you don't want to be part of the recording. Same principle applies to screen sharing while in calls. The monitor is pretty much off limits for the participants. Quirks and all, the iPad still wears the crown in the tablet kingdom because it's a true tablet first with a sprinkle of computer on the side. Meanwhile, the Surface Pro plays it the other way around. It's more of a laptop in tablet's clothing and in this video, I pit these two titans against each other to see if the iPad's reign can be challenged. Like and subscribe to the channel as well as my newsletter and as always, it's been an absolute pleasure. This is E, over and out.